Hi, Ted, what a delight. Um, you guys all joined within the last minute. I know it because I was here two minutes ago. Hi, Ted. Hi, Matthias. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Hello. Was that I help? always mix up in time and on time. I always mix it up. Yeah, you're all exactly timed. Um, I'm just checking my speakers and everything here. And as you cannot see, because I'm hogging the screen, Valentina is also here. Hello. <laughs> she will be more, uh, hang on, let me see if I can adjust this thing. Boom, 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 center stage. Ooh, hello. <laughs> That's better. Just opening. Uh, Right. Hello, Mark. I haven't seen you in a while. You've been a bit snowed under. Yeah, well, I just submitted my Hypertext 23 paper today, so we'll see how it goes. Fantastic. And uh, Pete, you're uh, relatively new to me. Hello. Very new. Hello. Where are you in the world? I'm in San Diego, California. Oh, my brother was just in San Diego. It's a nice place. Yes, yes, it really is. I haven't been, but uh, spent spent some time further up north. Hi, Bob. So, do none of you watch for all mankind? Hello. No. No, I haven't seen it. It's an incredible show on Apple TV. The recurring joke is, "Hey, hi, Bob." <laughs> yes. I think we'll wait a few more minutes um, to see who will be filtering in today. But if anyone wants to say something now or ask a question, uh, why not? I'll only be here for an hour. Um, I have a physical therapy session after this. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's more than an hour? Sorry, what? It's more than an hour? Two. Oh. Well, it's it's a funny thing. These things go with, you know, a little bit stilted in the beginning, and then we get into something, and then we kind of wrap up a bit, and then, oh, there's this other thing. So two hours tends to be a good uh, good thing. Um, we have these meetings every Monday, and you're all very welcome to join anytime. Last Monday, it was two and a half hours. At the two-hour mark, suddenly things became this, that, and the other. Well, at the two-hour mark, I have another meeting, so... Yes. Yeah, no, I don't think we'll go over today. We tend to be more organized on the, the proper semi-monthly meetings. But um, Pete, since you are the newest member, uh, we know you're in San Diego. What is your interest in this field? Uh, and by the way, which aspect of the field are you interested in? <laughs> what field? Exactly. <laughs> Text, AI, education, the whole thing. Which, what, what aspect? Um, my main, uh, my main passion is uh, helping to helping people to connect uh, and work better together. Uh, I've got a strong interest in wikis, uh, and I've got a, a project called Massive Wiki, uh, which is using Markdown and Git to to make distributed wikis more or less. Um, so I've been working with text for decades and hypertext for decades and, and, uh, and now chat GPT a lot, uh, for six months or whatever, uh, having a lot of fun with it. That's very relevant. Just text. Uh, and I come by way of Jack Park. Maybe, maybe Jack would be more familiar. Oh yeah. No, Jack, I know very well. I've known him since the, um, forever ago, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a long time. Yeah, so I'm glad that um, Jack introduced you to the to the community. I think at least Barbara Tversky will be here. Alan, for sure, he's presenting something. Hmm, normally, people are very timely. Hi, Alan. Didn't you say Vint Cerf was going to be involved? Yes, but he has something running over, so he will be joining us in about half an hour. So he's coming. And uh, iPad.Livia, is that you, Livia? Yes, it is. 
Hello. Yes, it's me. Hi, can you see me? Yes, calling from uh, somewhere in Manhattan or nearby, right? Yeah, yeah, from the middle of the East River. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. That's really so? cool. Yeah. So, we're, yeah, we're just waiting for a few more people to filter in and just kind of introducing a bit. Oh, finally, there's Bob Yan. I haven't seen him since yesterday, so that's a long time. Right, okay, so we don't waste too much time. I'm going to read, so I don't talk forever, a brief introduction, and then we will open the floor to chat, and then we will have some uh, lightning talks coming up from some of you. Does that sound reasonable? Great. When we talk about AI and academia, there is a lot to untangle, a lot to connect, and there's a lot to invent. As with all powerful developments, there are concerns and outright dangers, which we are aware of. The session today, however, is based on accepting that AI is here and will not be put back in the lab. We ask how we can employ AI for good in academia, and that is not simple. The term is probably something we should approach head on. Artificial intelligence, to me at least, can be looked at as an artificial, meaning created version of something which is natural, human intelligence, and thus remains measured against ourselves. Is this a useful metric and is this a useful name? Is machine learning any better? Many believe not, since the machine does not learn, not in the human sense. For fun, I propose the term analytical engine, harking back to Charles Bagbage's 19th century calculating device engine to make it less mysterious and analytical to remind us that this can help us think. We may then ask what kinds of engines there are. There are tiny engines, the engines of conversion from text to speech and speech to text, as well as gesture and image recognition. There are engines for display such as text to image. Hi Barbara, I'm just doing a brief intro and then we move on. There are engines for display, such as text to image, engines for views, engines for analysis, engines to present information from different perspectives and more. There are many different kinds of engines, and there are many different ways we can interact with them through text, chat, speech, gesture, and more. There are engines we interact with directly and ambiently, engines we will call assistants, and engines we will think of as things, virtual shapes of knowledge. We may think of them as single engines, but they will likely be composed of different engines which will be employed as needed and discarded when done, just like a paintbrush or a random person we ask for directions in the street. Today I hope our discussion will open up new ways of looking at the engines of AI and how it relates to academia, both for students reading to learn and writing to demonstrate learning objectives, as well as professional academics who also learn to read to learn, but write not to demonstrate learning objectives, but to produce new knowledge. And today I want to make it clear that <coughs> normally I talk about text in quite a strict sense today, and for AI in general, we will consider the broader implications and instantiations of text. More text is not at all necessarily better. Better text is better. Considerations. We should consider what AI eats. I would suggest that strong, open and clear data and metadata is part of the key. From my perspective, that is, of course, visual meta. Most of you know what that is. Garbage in, garbage out, right? We should also consider what we want to retain as human work. As I write this in a coffee shop in town earlier today, on my MacBook with a 13-inch screen, and as I'm struggling with writing corrections for my PhD thesis, which is very long, I wonder what a natural length of writing might be, considering foveal vision movement of eyes and neck, maybe this is roughly a good size for most text to read and write, particularly since this is about the size of a normal book opened wide. Could I present a provocation that maybe academic papers should fit in such a single view? Imagine if they had to, and if everything past this one screen would have to be linked to, it was not simply expected that the user should have to read through it all. In other words, how about we strive to write abstracts for this size so that the AI won't end up doing it for us? 
That's kind of the thing, because that is what AI is going to be doing now. This is how I request that future of text articles be submitted. Yes, Ted, this is hypertext and a naive version of hypertext, but maybe it's time to unleash it with the aim of expressing ourselves so clearly and connectedly that other people won't need AI to summarize our work, simplify it or connect what we write. Today, so for today, there will be some lightning talks starting in an hour. I thought it would be good to have them in the middle. Please text chat to me who would like to present. I think I know most of you, but in case there's someone else. And it would be nice if what we discussed today becomes usefully available for future access. Of course, the video will go online and the transcript will be generated, but how can we make it more accessible these two hours? How can AI interactions help with this? Imagine the shape of the conversation as a piece of virtual clay, which you can continuously shape to get what you need out of it. If this is an aspect of interest to you, please share any thoughts you might have. And with that goal in mind, may I ask you to introduce yourself the first time you speak by name and maybe affiliation or similar. Also, when you're speaking, maybe throw in a keyword here and there, such as I think this is important. That may also help us in the future find out what's useful. So I wrote in the email to you guys. The issue is that it will be important to work to find out how this can be useful for the whole academic process and augmenting us, not simply brain dump of outsourced writing to clog up the corpus. How can we make it happen? How can AI help augment the academic process and us and the human academics? And with that, the floor is open. It's got to be somewhat pitching with something, otherwise I have further provocation, so please go ahead. Oh, Alan, I see that you're thinking about something. Why don't you start with what we talked about on Monday and talking about the use of language around AI. That may be a very good place to, to kick us off. You were the reason I introduced the joking notion of engines. Uh, you said something more intelligent on the matter. Sure, happy to. Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Laidlaw. And yeah, we talked about this briefly on Monday. And um, I um, uh, uh, I won't go into my background very much, but I, I've, I've touched machine learning some in the enterprise in previous jobs. So I've had a kind of a different experience with it before Transformers and everything. Very much enjoying uh, everything that's happening to GPT, even though, of course, it will result in an apocalypse. Um, what we talked about on Monday, uh, I mentioned uh, an article or a newsletter from Vinkatesh Rao, uh, and he, I think he had a really great uh, way to think about AI, um, and, and it may help you know, guide uh, the conversation or buttress it or something, but uh, he compares it to uh, flight. So I'm going to, hopefully I'll, I've got the, yeah, okay, so I think this is it. Um, so he's talking about in this article, and I could send a link to it, he's talking about the physics of, of artificial intelligence. That's what he wants to try and, and bring to the surface. What are, what, is there a physics to it? We're so caught up in all the hype and everything that, that, uh, it, it means and all the applications we can have now, but are there principles behind it that we can hold on to? So he says, you'll notice, firstly, I did not say, oh, sorry, I did not say the physics of art of artificial intelligence. Six months ago, I might have used a more qualified phrase, but I think it's been adequately demonstrated in the last six months that at least intelligence, if not subtler notions like consciousness or sentience that may not may or may not be well posed, is not a substrate is not substrate dependent. The physics of intelligence is no more about silicon semiconductors or neurotransmitters than the physics of flight is about feathers or aluminum. And that's the point where it gets interesting. These low-level substrates constrain but do not define the physics in either case. When you analyze the flight characteristics of an airplane or a bird, you might quickly check the strength to weight ratio of bone and feather composites or aluminum, but then you move on to talking about wing geometry, lift versus drag, and so on. Concepts that still belong in physics but at different levels of abstraction. Flight is actually a very good reference phenomenon for thinking about intelligence. Since it is it too is a property of biological organisms that reproduce with non-living machines that work uh, on similar but not identical principles. Understanding the physics of flight 
in a way that's agnostic to the differences between birds and aircraft is a similar problem to that of understanding the physics of intelligence, whether realized with silicons or neurons. Interestingly, even though aerospace engineering is a mature discipline today, the physics of flight is actually still quite mysterious. Uh, and then he goes on to the kind of properties that he would like to, or questions he would like answers to. But um, is that what you were referring to, Prode, on Monday, first off, that analogy? Yeah, I, it, it was, because I think it's it's very, very thoughtful. Um, you know, in my own PhD thesis, m most of you know me, you know that I'm dealing with metadata. And one of the things I've been fighting with people is the definition of metadata. And Ted here provocatively said there's no such thing. And since Ted is one of the wisest people I've ever come across, I had to take that seriously. And my examiners are saying, oh, only this and that is metadata. So the issue becomes definitions. We're defining things that are changing. So just like with AI, it is certainly not an artificial intelligence. It is something else. So what you said there, I think, is a really good reference point to broaden our thinking, because the AI we use for speech to text, you know, why is that considered the same thing as something that will rewrite the Bible as a poem? So we got to change our languages. And the this thing you mentioned about flight as an analogy, I think, makes a lot of sense because there is an environment, there is an action, and there's a difference between a hummingbird and a fighter plane. And we know that, but they both fly. You know, there's going to be the equivalent force differences of AIs, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, um one of the things I'm I'm personally interested in, and this might uh, apply to Ted, it's certainly in the spirit of uh, of Xanadu and things. Is 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 uh, I, I guess I was thinking about GPT, and even the most conservative critic of GPT would probably um, uh, concede that that the GPT large language models is as big a deal as newspapers, right? So maybe it's as big as the internet. Maybe it's as big as fire. Let's just let's just call it a newspapers. And the interesting thing about that for me personally, I was a cartoonist in my previous life. Um, and and comics are a bastard medium, right? They are they are an accident of, uh, you know, you had newspapers and then there was this uh, ability to you know throw in images. And and then I guess there was some other X factor, some appetite for whimsy or something else that kind of. Uh, glommed together and made these this new what became a new art form or a new medium called comics and uh i think that we'll we can see the same thing with gpt that if we change our goals uh rather than being how how can we get to greater truth or how can we make sure it doesn't do something wrong and think about it as like hey here's this new medium what other mediums will naturally spill out of it um, so I've, I've been playing with um, some wild ideas there to see what might be possible. Yeah, perfect. Um, I just got a private message from Fabienne. I, I have to read it to you because it's hilarious. Fabienne, the open source guy, the Linux guy, is calling himself iPhone today. So <laughs> I thought that was very cute. Um, <clears throat> but the... hmm? Busted. Yes, busted indeed. No, it, it's an important thing because, um, you know, this community has very much been about VR for the last year and a half. And VR, of course, there is a web VR and there is what is owned by Meta. And then now there's going to be what's owned by Apple. It's going to be the same with AI, of course. So, it, you know, it reminds me that Siri is a very different AI than ChatGPT and, and so on. So we should probably not not forget about the commercial interests. So in a more specific thing, then question for you guys, uh, is it fair to say that using AI to read either one article, a book or a whole corpus is okay for a student, but maybe authoring is not as okay? Is there a difference? And if so, why? May I respond to Alan instead of answering your question, Frody? Oh, 
Hi guys, Matthias calling from Hamburg, Germany. I'm a computer scientist, interaction designer, and the founder of the Chrono Research Lab. So doing lots of heritage stuff. Also sometimes refer to myself as a kind of software archeologist. That was my introduction. So for, for Alan, I, I like your comparison with the birds and with the aluminum of the planes and taking the function of this thing in the air and saying both are somewhere airborne and therefore they must be flying. However, this is defined by the physical stuff. So this was your analogy. Um, I, I'm not frankly quite sure whether this analogy can be transferred to our topic today. So whether we have humans, all of us, and all the people on this planet who don't join this call. And on the other hand, this AI thing, and the question in, in your example was, they are flying, we are up the ground. And the question right now is whether this other thing, this AI thing, does the same as we do. And therefore, I'm not quite sure of your analogy, because both are in the air, so therefore they are flying, however they do it, is Trans, can be transported, can be transformed to, to the other subjects, let's humans and the other AI stuff. So we don't really know what we are in terms of flying. What's the correspondent thing of flying when we go to intelligence? What What is it? What, what constitutes us? So therefore, I'm not quite sure. I, I like your example, but I, I don't take it for granted as an, ex, as, an, as, an, as an relation for humans to AI as planes to birds. Could I make myself clear? Absolutely. And I'll just uh, respond quickly to that. First off, not my analogy, Venkatesh Rao, I was just reading from his newsletter and it's, uh, I I think it's, a, yeah, it's a prompt. I don't necessarily fully agree with it either, but I do think, I think what he's seeking is, uh, you know, philosophers have try, tried to figure out what being is, what consciousness is, what cognition is, right? And I think he's taking another stab at it that maybe we could hone down on something like that that's intelligence that's like sort of connection making and is there a is there a level at which you know of course this is similar to turing is there a level at which when connections are made uh, in such a way that you know it's it's equivalent not to that maybe the level of human intelligence but it's it should be considered intelligence in the same way that for a while we didn't fly as good as birds flew now we in some ways, if you look at it some ways, we still don't. If you look at it in other ways, other metrics, we fly far better than birds do, right? So uh, it, it's a it's a, a flawed framework simply because there's so many different ways you can interpret it, right? But it's a pretty good prompt. Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And I love software archaeologist as a, <laughs> as a term. It's great. And I have another comment on, on fraud. I really appreciate your reintroduction of the analytical engine, because this artificial intelligence, this word intelligence implies some similarity already. And I think this might be the end of our discussion, whether this other AI stuff is really intelligent in a human sense or in some supernatural general sense. So therefore, I'm also happy that Ted Nelson joins us today. He's famous for introducing new terms. Analytical engine is taken already. So maybe we also might come up eventually today with another term for this strange thing that happens inside the computer that produces amounts of character strings that look like human text, but maybe they are not really. So uh, feel free to introduce new words for what's happening right now. I think if we use human terms like read, write, understand, produce, all that, that human related stuff, we really fall into the trap to attribute um, human abilities too early to the artificial systems. You, you took the words right out of my, uh, my uh, head there. And David, we're coming to you in a second. But Ted, if you have anything you want to say in terms of what you think would be a good term for uh, this AI thing, uh, please no, do. The, the term it. artificial intelligence has been in use for almost a century. Well, certainly since the 1960s. And, and uh, it's covered a great many different kinds of activity, heuristic models and, and searching and, 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 uh, and uh, the, remember the chat model the, 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 that uh, Weizenbaum had at MIT that pretended to be a, a uh, psychotherapist and lots of people insisted it really was intelligent and understood them. So, Eliza, I believe. Eliza, right. 
So, um, so the, the point is that the term has been around for a long time, and I don't see any reason to throw it out. Fair enough, Ted. Uh, David. I wanted to ask a clarifying question for the question you just asked. So I'm under, wondering, is there something about authors using these chatbots or other aspects of AI or whatever you want to call them um, that you think is negative or taking people and groups away from science, from actually creating transformative science? I, I'll let the group answer that. But first of all, hi, Dini. Very glad you're here. And I see Les is here too, sneaking in. Everybody be on your best behavior. Les is my senior advisor. Um, <laughs> so a, a, a clearly bad case of authors using AI is if they lazily say, here are some things, write an article about it. You know, that doesn't really contribute to anything in mankind, I would think. But what does the rest of the group here think? Where, where can an author use AI to present something thoughtful and useful? Or is it not about what is being produced, but how the AI can inspire the author? Well, I think you made an interesting point there, because isn't, oh, isn't hang it? On, Mark, 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 Mark. Uh, remember a super important rule. First time you speak, please introduce yourself. Oh, the, uh, sorry. Um, transcript and for the AI to understand what we're saying in the future. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Um, hello again. Hello, posterity. Um, I, I'm Mark Anderson, uh, calling in from uh, south coast of the UK. Um, I was recently a fellow student with Freud at Southampton University. In fact, uh, Les was one of my uh, thesis supervisors as well. Um, and I am now in uh, post-thesis recovery and uh, mainly working on various matters, hypertext. Um, we're probably more of an interest in, in older systems, less than the current ones. Um, and the, the point that brought me to the microphone was uh, in answer to your question is um, the human in the loop seems to be missing here. Um, we're either enthused or enraged by what things like ChatGPT are doing. Um, but we don't seem to be asking, considering our relationship with these new actors that we have. Um, they're obviously not going to go away and they'll obviously get better, but they are effectively, um, you know, they're probability engines. They don't have a human understanding. And one of the, so one of the things they lack is our, our ability for associative thought. Um, and I've really been remarkably struck since the sort of the latest AI things came out, the, the lack of the lack of sort of discussion or thought about where, where, if nothing else, we can fill in around things. We've been more worried about whether we're going to lose our job or whether other people are going to lose their job, uh, which probably affects how we feel about it. Uh, rather than actually sort of looking at the positives and thinking, well, where do we fill in and where is our role? And, and indeed, the, the sort of the ethics and the trust issues um, in how we interact with these, um, these new actors. I think that that's clearly a very important point. I'm just wondering, uh, David, who is still waiting for feedback. Um, David, do you want to do a 10 second version of your question? Yeah. What is the concern uh, with respect to the research process of the use of these models? I mean, I'm assuming that if it's bad research, then it's not going to make it through the peer review process. So, um, yeah, that that's that's my question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure most of you have seen the cartoon online. That is, someone who writes a prompt to apply for a job, and then the result is this massive dare sir, blah blah blah, and then the person who receives it uses another prompt to reduce it to a summary that's the same as the original. So, you know, academia is not about producing vast volumes of stuff. At least it shouldn't be. So the concern is, you know, press a button and you get something that looks like knowledge. Just waste people time to read it, I would say. But I would really like to hear more perspectives of the difference between augmenting reading and authoring. I mean, I have built into my software reader 
ask AI, select any text, any PDF, do all these fancy things that are delivered by Open, open API, Open AI, excuse me. And it's really interesting that when I'm implementing it for author, the issues become something else. I want the user to be inspired to get other things. I do not want to have a piece of software that said, here's the next paragraph written automatically for you. Is that my prejudice or is that a realistic notion? Uh, okay, Fabian, are you on the same or is it different? Because I think Dini would like to reply to this topic. Is that right? Okay, uh, Fabian, do you mind waiting? Okay, thank you. So Dini, please introduce yourself, even though, of course, you need no introduction. I'm Dini Grigar from Washington State University, Vancouver. I run the Electronic Literature Lab and the Curator and Managing Director of ELO's The Next. Yeah, so your, your question about is it, can it be useful in some way? And so what I've been using in, using this in my hypertext class, I'm teaching hypertext and Mark Anderson has come in and kindly spoken and shared his research with us. But I give a prompt to the students and they use that prompt to query chat GPT to get kind of a general sense of what's out there. Of course, there's no depth in the response, right? It's just a general general comments. And what happens is a lot of that information may not even be correct. So part of what they do is they use that as a way to get started in their thinking. They take the information they receive and they dig down deeper to verify information because it doesn't come with references. To look to see where that information came from and then use that as a, as a jumping off point to write their papers. And if you remember when Wikipedia first was was you know released, there are a lot of people in my field that were unhappy with Wikipedia being used in the classroom. They said it was a cheap, easy way out of thinking that students weren't going to go and look deeper into this in the topic. They would just cite Wikipedia. But what's happened over the over the years is that Wikipedia has turned out to be very useful because it's a starting point. And then it does offer the references that they can use to move forward. You know, Jet, Jet, Chat GPT is in its earliest form. So we might see some changes over the next, you know, coming months, days, years, and that it might take a different shape and form. There might be tools that come out of Chat GPT that are, that are extremely useful. So I don't want to be alarmist about the use of it. I think it's up to faculty to be smart and how we use it in our classroom and our research. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dini. Uh, David, I think we, uh, unless you have something quick on that point, uh, move on to. Yeah, yeah, well, this, I guess I want to speak to kind of how I think about it. First of all, the thing is unstoppable. There's no way that you're going to prevent people from using it. I don't actually think, I mean, I think we're a long way away and probably you'll never be able to, to just say, oh, go ahead and, and write this report um, and, and have it be high quality representing the, the things, your actual train of thought. I mean, I don't see research being being a kind of a click click a button and and it gives you the whole thing and it's exactly right i don't, I don't think that's going to happen i i've been doing a lot of writing with chat gpt and um it's just kind of a it's as dean was saying it, it's it's it helps me get started it helps me get some structure it helps me with transition sometimes it helps me with ideation but it i have to determine the flow of the whole thing. I mean, it, it's not going to give me a new article. That's just not going to happen. I I need to direct the whole thing. And I, I think that's... that's meeting. Meeting. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Something's going on. Uh... So, uh, D David, I don't know if you can hear me, but something went scratchy on your voice. He's mute. He's muted. Yeah, I did that because the, the, mm. something, something went wrong. Um, okay. Yeah, you, 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 it went weird. So that's why I muted you. But okay. So that's a good summary. You're saying that currently you can use AI to help you make, but you have to uh, direct the shape, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, over to Pete. 
Um, thank you, Fred. I, it's a, uh, thank you for the question. It's an interesting one. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, sorry, uh, Peter Kaminsky, San Diego, um, Massive Wiki, among other, other affiliations. Um, and I like to work on helping people collaborate together. Uh, one of the things I said in chat is, uh, I, 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 the way I think of ChatGPT is as a power tool uh, for uh, text and knowledge. So in the same way that I could use a bandsaw or a table saw instead of a handsaw, or, or you know, maybe even something simpler than a handsaw, like a knife or something. If I need to cut, cut a lot of lumber, if I need to make cabin, cabinetry, um, having power tools is really useful. And, it, and it, it doesn't really do different things as much as it does the same kinds of things I could do in a more polished way and in a faster way. I can do more of it. So I can explore more with with ChatGPT, and I think <clears throat> I think it's inbounds. I I don't think I ever want to see people having ChatGPT read something instead of reading it themselves, um, because there's just it's it's not the fact that it's an AI. It, it's the fact that anytime you summarize something, you've lost some of the original. So you haven't read the original if you've read a, a summary of it. You need to read it. But in examining a text, um, I, I learn more from a text when I can uh, have GPT summarize it in different ways or ask questions about the text, uh, or if I can rewrite the text in different ways. Uh, can, you, you know, can you take the important points of this uh, and summarize it? Can you? Um, make uh, bullet points out of that? Can you take those bullet points and, and rewrite the summary? Um, that kind of playing with the text, which hasn't really ever been uh, available as a tool, is something that I've found super valuable. And um, uh, I recently created a, a summarization of a 87,000 word email exchange back and forth, a debate about, um, about stuff. And I found that in even in resummarizing it more than once, uh, summarizing it more than once, I, I learned a lot about what was in the text. And then uh, I it it was like um, it was like having a reading partner or uh, a reading circle uh, where we have different viewpoints around the text and could yeah. go around it. Yeah. I I think you you asked, is it okay to have chat? Is it okay to press a button and say you know write write something? I think. The thing to remember is that, or, or a thing to consider is attribution. So I, I, I don't think it's ever okay to say, um, I wrote this, you know, I, I pushed the button and made, made a machine write it, um, and then say, that's what I wrote. I don't think that's okay. Um, I think it is okay um, to use ChatGPT as a writing and thinking partner, a research partner, um, and I think, I don't know how this is going to work out in academia or or anywhere, I, but I, I think you want to say, you know, portions of portions of what I did was influenced by thinking about reasoning with, with uh, reasoning about the subject with the aid of a uh, an LLM uh, with the aid of ChatGPT, and and ideally, I like um, I'd like to see those kinds of credits go down to. Um, I use ChatGPT, uh, GPT-4 uh, version, March, whatever, um, not just ChatGPT. Um, so I think um, I, a way I think about ChatGPT is that it's, uh, it's a large corpus, not the entire corpus, but it's a large corpus of human knowledge um, and uh, human expression through text. And so in a way, ChatGPT is an interface to this corpus of knowledge, and it lets you remix and recall parts of that large body of knowledge that would be really difficult to do by yourself. So, so in a way, if you're writing something and you're asking ChatGPT to summarize, summarize some knowledge or, or synthesize some knowledge, uh, you know, take, uh, take some understanding about physics and flight and birds and aluminum, tell me, you know, tell me how that works together. That's something that I could have gone out and done the research for in a long, uh, long session, or I can kind of have ChatGPT sketch the, 
the, the, the outlines of that. And then I can incorporate that kind of as an external source. You know, I've, I've had a thinking partner and I want to be cautious there because I think I'm doing the thinking and ChatGPT is doing the recalling of other stuff. It's actually not thinking, obviously. But I've, I've uh, had, you know, I've, I've been augmented in, in my use of um, and, and recall and remixing of human knowledge by a tool. So I think it's okay to use ChatGPT as a, as a tool. Um, I think it's actually a really important thing to do because we can do a lot more, a lot faster, a lot better. Um, uh, I, I agree that it's, there's a danger that people can use it in a very uh, rote, very trite way, um, but I don't think that's a, a, a useful or particularly interesting even use of it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Pete. Um, and just as you put on your headphones, welcome, Bent. Uh, we're talking about slightly the difference between using AIs to, for authorship and readership. And uh, Pete, just on that point, um, as a software developer, I like what you say in terms of crediting your AI partner. It would also be good to, as we credit people like Mark Anderson, I called him today to say that he may have actually written my thesis for me, but he doesn't know it yet. Ah. But <laughs> that, that will be a, a point of discussion, you know, so that should be credited, but also as a software developer, if someone writes, this was written an author uh, using these and these tools, it may help the reader understand what mental tools were available. So yes, for AI, but also further. But also kind of on the flip side of that, uh, many of us here are also photographers. And in the olden days, when things started to go digital, it was a big thing of this image has not been manipulated. We don't do that anymore. Everything's gone through Lightroom. Everything's had some work to do. So it'll be interesting to see the cultural notions of how much augmentation is for granted and how much augmentation is seen as being uh, something that needs to be highlighted. No one will say, I use spell check, of course. That's a trite example. But at what level do you need to do what you said? It will be really interesting. So um, thanks very much. And anyone else have something on that specific point before we go over to Peter? Having yes. Uh, I think we're doing this thing now. You're very good at it, but just please a uh, brief introduction uh, for the recording, please. Oh, and you're muted. Still, you're, you're, you're still muted, Vince. I try. Oh, there we are. How's that? Yeah. Okay, so this is just a brief comment about the use of the large language models. Uh, some of us think that although it's, uh, it hallucinates and does other kinds of interesting things, it also uh, potentially generates an interesting collection of ideas uh, and juxtapositions, some of which we might never have put together. And our, so our problem here is just to learn how to make use of these tools uh, in order to filter out the stuff that doesn't make any sense, but possibly discover of them as idea generators, but not necessarily uh, as finished tools. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think that's very much in line with uh, what was um, okay. Um, I, I think Peter is actually on a similar point, so we will continue straight across. And please intro, Peter. Okay, my name is Peter Wasilko. I'm an attorney, programmer, and independent scholar out of Westchester County in New York. And um, I'd like to raise a nice distinction that's popped up in the literature over the years, and that's the concept of psychological realism. Uh, the notion of, is a software tool behaving in a manner that's actually mirroring how a human performs the same task, or is it achieving a comparable result, but using some completely different computationally intensive approach that doesn't at all model what a human's doing internally? Um, and in that regard, I see ChatGPT more as a thesaurus on steroids or a writing prompt generating tool than anything else. If it's seen a lot of documents that are similar to what you're prompting for, it can produce a freakishly realistic result. For instance, I asked the system to write a press release for Apple's new VR rig and reading it, it sounded, like I said, yeah, you know, just freakishly realistic. You'd swear that it was a legitimate thing. It even came up with a VR 
website URL off of apple.com that doesn't exist to generate a quote from the head of the company that sounded like something that he would say talking about how the wonderful new hardware is going to be empowering people to do things that they were never able to do before. And it's completely plausible because the system has digested tens of thousands of press releases from the corpus of documents that's come through it over the internet. Now, if you're working in obscure academic area, it really goes off the rails fast. I told it, you know, the prompt was that it was a dissertation advisor recommending hypertext papers for a new graduate student to read, and it suggested a non-existent Mark Bernstein paper from a conference that didn't happen with him making assertions about the field that he never made. And if you were just relying on that as a student, you're going to go down a rabbit hole and have a disaster. Now, the problem here is, of course, it requires the person grading the student's work to exercise a much higher level of control and supervision because we can't assume that the paper is being turned in by the students are actually being turned in by the student now we have this new possibility that they're being synthesized on the fly with again very plausible trains of thought and document based upon the existing corpus um, i see a couple possible ways around that one might be to tiger team the system and have students grade the accuracy of each other's papers in law, we already have the notion of law review, where the main function of law review editors is to literally go through and check every single citation, not only to find the work, but to make sure that the format of the citation precisely mirrors the rules in the Blue Book. And the Blue Book is a system, a uniform system of citation, which defines exactly how you're going to cite something, where you can abbreviate, what abbreviations you will use to make sure that we nail down those sources with impeccable accuracy. So I could see having a system where you have each student submit their paper and also review a paper of another student to at least flag things that they think are suspect so that the actual review time could be focused. Then, of course, you'll wind up with a meta level where the students who are reviewing the other people's system will prompt an AI to determine whether the paper generated by the first student was generated by an AI or not, and they'll dump in the response from the AI as their answer. So you can really go down that rabbit hole. And I think what we need to do is focus much more on process than output. When I was a first year law student, we had the most maddening legal writing course. And what they did was they'd tell us to go off and write a brief to answer whatever legal problem it is. And we'd submit our brief to the TAs. And the TAs would simply give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down response. Not unlike the training system that ChatGPT is going through, where you might even have an AI produce critiques of responses generated by the AI's prompt. Uh, so what would happen is we'd go and we'd write this wonderful little brief and we'd submit it. And all we got back from the TA was, this is an acceptable brief or rewrite the brief. And it became utterly maddening because once you went through a couple cycles of rewrites, you'd have absolutely no idea what you do to move what you were writing closer to what they were looking for because they'd never tell us what they were looking for. And it was just utterly insane. And we didn't focus on the process. So because of that, again, you're only looking at the output. We weren't able to get feedback from the TAs telling us what we need to do to come closer to what they want because they really didn't even know what they want. All they know is that they'll know it when they see it. Um, now, if we took a literate programming kind of a model, literate programming was an idea introduced by Donald Newf, and that was that when you're writing a program, your primary intended audience should be another human trying to understand what the program is doing, as opposed to the compiler trying to generate a piece of executable code from the specification that you wrote in the programming language. And it's entirely easy to write a specification that can pass the compiler that is doing something entirely opposite and contradictory to what you thought you were doing. So you can have a regular expression. There's so many ways to make errors describing a regular expression, which is a pattern matching specification. So a one letter typo will produce a valid regular expression in many cases that matches something, again, entirely unlike what you thought you were matching. And those kinds of bugs that get introduced are extremely hard to find. So with literate programming, you would write the documentation first and the code secondary. So you'd explain why you are writing the code in the form that you are writing it and it would be at the level for another human. And the system would then perform two operations, tangle and weave. The tangle operation would throw out all of the documentation, reorganize the program in 
the order of dependencies. So it form a directed acyclic graph, graph representing your ultimate program that you are trying to write. The individual chunks could be assembled in any order. All that mattered was the fact that the system recognized where the dependencies were between one chunk and another chunk so that it could perform a topological sort on them and put them in the correct order to generate valid source code. So that's the tangling operation. Then the weaving operation would go through and produce a hyperlinked indexed cross-reference document representation of the program saying this code is used in these other sections. It was defined in these other sections. And because of that focus on what you thought you were doing, it's much easier to see whether your train of thought was wrong or whether the mechanical operation of encoding that train of thought in the programming language was where you went wrong. So in today's application with chat GPT, I think the solution is to have the students write literate essays describing, okay, here's where I prompted the AI system. Here's what the AI came back with. Here's what I chose to keep or where I chose to throw out from the AI system. And here's my final paper. So that you put more emphasis on the process of achieving the final paper rather than just throwing a final paper at a TA and having them give a thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, I'll rest now and you can digest that. That was a very worthwhile overview of using uh, AI as a as a partner and recording that. Um, anyone have anything specific on that before we go on to Fabienne? Not iPhone, Fabienne. There's quite a bit in the chat. You might want to bring that up, uh, Frodo. Yeah, what, what I think we should do is um, ignore the chat for now. And then in 10 minutes, we'll do a few lightning talks for those who want to do that. And then we'll go through the chat bit by bit. Because when we have a transcript for this, the transcript and the chat, they really don't line up. So um, is that cool? Oh, yeah, lots of nodding. That's wonderful. OK, um, Fabian. Hello, hello. So my name is Fabian Dimitri. Uh, I... Fabian, your, your volume is a bit loud and squeaky. Can you tweak it somehow? Sorry. Uh, I can speak like this. Oh, perfect. Better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I was trying to be as loud as possible to be clear, but that didn't work out. So, my name is Fabian Benito. I'm a prototypist. Um, I make proof of concept, not proper software. Uh, mostly for the European Parliament, uh, but yeah, for mostly for the on virtual and mental events on the web. Um, a little less loud, Fabian. A little less loud, sorry. I'll be like this. Um, so, uh, you let me know if it's okay now. Okay. Um, well, I'll be quiet. Uh, it's, it's the, the uh, uh, great mic. sound like you're in, in an aquarium, so it's kind of like. Oh, okay. Um, otherwise... think, Fabian, do you mind going back and logging in on the phone again, or are you going to be sharing screen now or later? I'll, I'll come back with a phone. Sorry about that. Right, we'll, we'll skip over to Les and then come back to you, Fabian. Is that all right? Okay. Hi, boss. <laughs> Hello. I hope you can hear me all right. I'm having a few problems with my keyboard at the moment, and uh, who, who knows what these things do. My name's Les Carr. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Southampton with uh, Froden Mark. Um, I am, hello, <laughs> uh, nice to see everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm going to say something completely unfounded that I can hardly evidence, um, um, but uh, I, 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 my great, my advanced age tells me we've been here before, uh, not in terms of AI and large language models, but in terms of the fact that I think what we're, everyone's really busy with chat GPT, uh, you know, let's use that as the exemplar in just trying to recreate things we can already do. And it's like PDF, it's like, you know, sort of the first 10, 20 years of the web all over again, that we're, we're all going, oh, can, can we do the stuff that we did before? Um, and will it be cheaper? Will it be better? Will it be, you know, sort of, oh, will it be more expensive? Who's going to be, who's going to be disadvantaged by this? Uh, and the answer is, oh, you know, Silicon Valley tech bros, of course, people are going to be disadvantaged by this. Um, but um, what's what I'm really interested in is can we kind of 
feel our way towards the new capabilities we've we've invented a fluency machine effectively it's completely well not completely um it is to an unsatisfactory extent divorced from truth reality um a, a, a sort of objective um you know sort of um statements uh, and it but it does produce really nice um um as as oscar wilde would say you know it's the uh, um you know style is mu is very important in matters uh you know it's in really important matters i wish i could remember the importance of being earnest but you know it, it's style over substance it's fluency it's perfectly expressed and uh just as true as any observation in civilized society ought to be um and and we have to you know sort of learn to live with that but what does a fluency machine buy us um if we can if we can accommodate ourselves to it how how can we build it into new kinds of workflows um and of course this is a moving target there's going to be um uh, the fact that it can't cite things is you know sort of a product of its kind of like statistical basis as opposed to having some kind of formal knowledge model in it but we you know researchers will be uh, you know be hard at work trying to integrate those two processes i guess so uh um you know it may even be um you know sort of teams of people that we know so um that's all that yes i'm going to stop talking now that's um just a piece of perspective i'm trying to think about you know sort of um, where do we take it next? What what new things can we do? Thank you. Thanks, Les. Um, does anyone have anything immediately on that? Otherwise, we have promised Fabienne next. Okay, over to mainland Europe. Is it good now? Yes. Yes, super. Oui. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Fabien Benetou. Uh, I'm a prototypist based in Brussels, Belgium, continental Europe. Uh, I mostly work for the European Parliament in the innovation team. Uh, I mostly focus on virtual and augmented reality on the web. For the anecdote, though, uh, I earned a little bit of money with generative AI seven years ago. So I definitely think it's a, a fascinating and an important topic. Uh, I, I think the the depth of it is basically uh, what is epistemology uh, what is knowledge can we use machines uh, to create new knowledge uh, and in regardless of what being a 3d model music research so i think the 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 research itself is fascinating yet and as pro and others in in the future of text group hear me quite often i complain a lot about it because i think the commercial implementation of it is terrible. Uh, and for example, here we talk often about ChatGPT as if it was the uh, the AI. Uh, it's definitely the most popular, but it's also uh, to me, especially for research, maybe the most problematic because it's a black box. Uh, very simple. First, it's not open source, which is a problem. But even more important here, I would say we don't know what the data set is, like what is based on uh, just. Just this morning or yesterday, I was reading an article on, uh, I think, BARD and uh, the C4 uh, data set that was used to train it. And for the fun of it, I searched for my own website where I put a bunch of stuff from VR to my own words and, and yeah, really everything and anything. Uh, and then I was thinking, is somebody else uh, using uh, a large language model uh, built on the data set going to use my work? Which is fine, actually. Everything I post is uh, with a certain license. It's a, a permissive license, but I do expect attribution. So that's the part that worries me. Uh, and again, to loop back with epistemology, is I think provenance and going through citation is fundamental. Otherwise, we don't know where the ideas come from and eventually backtrack to both the good one and the bad ones. So I think to go back to the question of reading versus uh, writing, there is a huge difference. Uh, you can read and eventually if it's summarized and it's colloquially bullshit, that sounds like a huge problem. Uh, but if you write with it and you're basically uh, intellectual washing uh, 
work that has been done before without citing properly, then I think it's very good. I think, 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 I that, that we basically we lose provenance for intellectual work, uh, and I don't think that's that's what should be done. So prompt for the mind and bicycle of the mind kind of metaphors, it's very fruitful. But at the same time, if it's used consciously or not uh, to bypass what would be the right citation process, I think it's actually dangerous for research. Thank you. Um, we're coming up to the lightning talk. So, um, Alan, are you okay pausing or do you have something quick now? Is it related to what Fabienne was saying? Um, it is, uh, a, it's all related, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's in the spirit of uh, uh, what uh, Leslie said, so I can wait. Yep. Well, okay, well, how about this then? Um, let's start what we call lightning talks now. Um, just physical hands up if you would like to do it, it, it's just like an extended few minutes or would like because Alan I think you should go first since you're queued up anyway Fabian are you going to be screen sharing okay great uh, anyone else want to set yourself up for that if you change your mind and you decide okay Ted please go ahead I see your hand are you on mute Okay. I, no, 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 you're okay. We can hear you now. An interesting concept is the question, of, is it conscious? And we may compare this with the question of, is a human being conscious? For example, if they're delirious or if they're asleep and dreaming, is, is dreaming a form of consciousness? That, that, that's, that's already a, a nice edge case because you, you, there's an awareness and even a sense of volition. <clears throat> And yet, it's it, it's a different kind of consciousness from when you're when you're alive, when you're awake. So, so the question of is a is a human being conscious when they're when they're uh, uh, seemingly uh, when there's no, seemingly no reaction, but we see a brain signal in the in the hospital. So, so it, it's it's a similar question. That's all I say. Yeah. Thanks, Ted. Um, okay, so for the semi lightning talks, what I think we'll do is Alan, me, Fabian. And if someone else wants to do something, just uh, ping me. Is that fair enough? So let, let's not be, you know, rock solid on how many minutes, but uh, Alan, please go ahead and chat away. Okay, thank you. I will uh, see if I can share my screen. And um, it's really just a continuation of what we've been talking about. So I don't have any sort of like, you know, impressive presentation, but can everybody see this? Looks really cool, actually, Alan. Okay, great. I'll continue. Uh, so this is, I was just dr drawing this out this morning uh, about what I wanted to mention, right? So, um, you know, just thinking about comics are a bastard medium. You can see here, product of newspapers. Uh, uh, in journalism, and then I thought about Robert Caro, famous journalist who uh, um, wrote The Power Broker, and uh, when he was uh, still in school, his writing teacher told him, you know, he's a fantastic writer, but you'll never accomplish your goals unless you stop writing with your fingers. And so that mm. shook me. And uh, then that's the why he moved to uh, longhand, writing on paper for The Power Broker. To take his time with it, right? I bring that up because uh, I think this ties into uh, Barbara Tversky's uh, work as well, that there are a lot of natural affordances that we have given up by moving to the medium that we are immersed in now. And that's not, uh, obviously we've gained a lot too, right? But kind of to what Leslie was saying, I see this fluency engine as a uh, a way to maybe take back some of that, right? So here's a few examples. Um, this is a, a just a drawing I made, and now I've exploded that drawing um, into bits and pieces, right? So then now I can explore them some more. For instance, uh, this morning I was having coffee and I had this great little cappuccino, and I could tell immediately by the foam art there that this is going to be a good cup of coffee. 
And then that made me think about how there's a coffee shop uh, in, in Los Angeles where you can actually have any image printed onto your phone, right? And mm -hmm. isn't that interesting that now the thing that was uh, just an act of making coffee, making cappuccino, and this sort of form falls out of it if you do it well, and it becomes a, a nice, pleasant piece of uh, uh, ornament, has now taken on its whole new life and become this way to make any kind of art on top of what was just a drink, right? There's something very human about that, uh, about how we add on uh, perhaps uh, layers, uh, uh, new mediums stacking on top of others. I'm not gonna criticize foam art. It may be the future of all art, I don't know, but it seems that at some point it's separated from the act of making a good cup of cappuccino. All right. That's how my mind is working. It's very like jumping all over. And you can't do that when you're reading an article necessarily. This is, uh, I'm bringing this up because these are natural extensions. These are ways that if I was talking to someone, my mind would go this way. But when we read things, we can't have that kind of interaction. Uh, I'm getting to a point in a moment here. I don't know if you all know Pinterest. I love Pinterest. It feeds me at times. I don't get to it very often, but whenever I open it up, I feel like uh, I am I am feeding a part of my brain that has been so starved. And it's it's these kinds of illustrations. Um, it's at times uh, uh, illustrations of of wave functions, and I feel like I'm learning something from this. It feels valuable to me even though it's not exactly words. And so this is sort of what I'm exploring with this fluency engine. Can we bring back some of these? Could I, could I uh, instead of writing out a prompt in text, maybe have uh, a couple of entities, you know, um, ideas, and then uh, uh, on top of them, put some of these frictions. Could a version of GPT interpret that, right? And, uh, and, and in that way, could I perhaps possibly make a composition rather than just saying, here's a prompt, GPT, pop out some text. Could I, could I say something like, uh, here's, a, here's my sheet music. And at the high end is, are the particulars, the, the finites. And at the bottom is the universal. And I'm just going to make a symbol and it knows me well enough to say that this is a high note. And, and maybe this little squiggle, like you'd see in shorthand, means a personal anecdote should go here. Tension, uh, uh, news bits. And as a, if we think of the fluency engine as, as a possible art form, it would be fun to see, even if it pulls from our own data and our own like journals and composes it in this way, what could come out of it? That's just one of many examples, but that's where I'm excited to see what could happen. And I'm more excited about that than I am trying to define what is epistemic, what is truthful or not, because I don't know that we have much control over that at this point. Um, so I, I, I kind of just brought up this springboard because I feel like there's so many cases of people treating words with a kind of semantic geometry. And we don't have a much of that power anymore when we use text editors in particular, right? Some of it's coming back like this is an infinite, infinite canvas that I'm using. Um, but could we start to write and draw and compose with ChatGPT and have a article or some sort of Paul Klee painting fall out of it? I got more to say, but I'll stop it there. Okay. How about no questions for 20 seconds? Let's just think about that. So there we go. I guess time is the white space of uh, meetings, right? Give us a bit of space to think. But 
Yeah, that, that was a very good uh, provocation, Alan, and you pull us in all kinds of weird angles for which I'm very grateful. Um, I think, Patrick, did you have your hand up for this or was it for something else? Or have you stepped away to get a coffee? That's fair enough. Um, okay, following on that, and I think uh, there will be many comments and questions coming from that, Alan, later, unless someone has something immediately, because it was just, you know, really off the wall in a good way. I'm going to show you something brief this end. I'll just prepare my uh, desktop real quick, right. So this is um, kind of fighting back in terms of um, what we can do that isn't to do with, uh, with AI. So this is Reader, most of you know it. We've added, of course, fashionably, we've added Ask AI. And the one that I find is quite useful that's not what I wanted to do, is uh, something like this. You come across something and you just say, list main points. And it, it does a reasonable job. And this is what Pete was talking about. This is what a lot of you were talking about in the sense that helping you get different views of things. So I think that's all very appropriate. But this is the thing I wanted to show you. So here is a um, paper by Mark. And I like this bit here. So I'm going to go into author. And um, oh, that was the speech for you. I'm going to paste this, just to copy and paste. And yeah, that's weird, the ACM uh, characters. But what you can see was pasted was a full citation. So that's nice. But now I'm going to do something else. I'm going to select a different block of text and I'm going to do Command Shift C. So I'm telling it to copy in a different way. So when I go now back to author and paste, all we get is Mark Anderson's citation. It has the quoted text in the quote in the citation dialog, which is nice. So we will now export this. Oh, that's surprising. Oh, <laughs> my external hard drive was asleep. It has to open that to see where I can save. Here we go. So here's the thing, and I'm going to close this document. If I now click on that one, look what I get. I get the information about the citation, plus I get the cited text, which is important in number two, because there is no quote. It's only there. The whole idea is to help you when you're reading something to get through to the point without cluttering your document with lots of citations. So that's this is why, Mark, I'm saying that you've written my thesis for me, because you were the one who requested the beginnings of this feature, because it really makes it faster to do the research reading. So here's the other thing, and uh, you see it says, don't dream it, see it. That was the title. I click on that, and it opens it opens that document because it's on the same computer. So as long as you have a research library, to whatever you subscribe to, you keep downloading it, you have the items. Why should you have to go to a download page? There's quite an overhead for this. So the whole point of this is give you a little bit of a sneak preview and they give you instant access. There's no artificial intelligence in here at all. But what it does do, because, hang on just really briefly, for those of you who don't know, at the end of these articles, we have um, the metadata in an entirely readable way so that it even knows the page number. Currently citing a page digitally is difficult to do, but this allows you to do that. So hopefully if we keep working in these ways by really focusing on the interactions, we'll get to a point where the AI can be part of these kind of fluidities. We can do the same kind of give me a different view, but you can do it in a crazy Allen view, not just in a crazy, in a sorry, a literal view such as this. Any questions or comments? By the way, if you don't have reader or an author already and you're on a Mac, just email me or whatever. Of course, I'll send you a code. I would desperately love your feedback. So over to. Uh, I, 
Oh, sorry. Oh. Who, what, when, where? Uh, I'll just, if I could add just a little addendum as to uh, a different way to, so so not caught up on the on the kind of like canvas and 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 uh, designs there, a different way to think about this, but maybe perhaps a more practical way would be, let's say, Frode, you and I are about to have a meeting and we've never met, right? And my GPT talks to your GPT and and it asks a simple question for both of us, right? It could be something like, um, uh, here's a conflict. Draw what you think a conflict looks like, right? Or uh, here's, uh, you know, what what do you, here's some images, uh, uh, which do you think are more blue, which do you think are more red, right? And and in that way, understand the baseline differences in our sort of umwelt and our personality that we might have from each other, right? And it could build in as we communicate um, scaffolding somewhat, not to not to uh, at all affect what we're going to say, but you know, um, if I if I start speaking hyperbolically, and that's not a thing that. You know, you, you want to stop and, and break the points down as hyperbolic. Well, if you got a prompt from your sort of assistant in this way, the, uh, that could say, like, when he's saying something hyperbolic, he's just being emotive rather than factual, then it could help in conversation. So this sort of a, a non-textual kind of thinking, I want to, I think there's potential for it to lead to even uh, uh, better interactions. So that's my footnote. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vince. Uh, thank you, Alan. I, I, this this um, it creates an image in my head of, of your chatbot uh, talking either to you, saying you're being an asshole or something, or maybe talking to the other guy saying what Alan really meant to say was, which uh, sounds like the White House speak. <laughs> yeah, right. Angry Obama, right. Yeah, I mean, th th this goes into a really important thing, because what I showed was something very linear and step by step and logical. And I think we need to retain that. And I want to champion that. However, uh, that what you're talking about is the intensely human side, which is colorful, it is fuzzy, and to help ways not necessarily to go from your brain to mine, but to just give some color as to what may be there. Um, for instance, Ted, always colorful, always hyperbolic, and always wonderful. So, Ted, please go ahead. I was your GPT representative there. The way Donald Trump speaks, it suggests that he is reading from chat GPT. <laughs> I think he's reading from a broken version, but yeah, fair point. Actually, that, that's, that's kind of a scary point, isn't it? No, actually, it's been actually, I think that uh, it's unlikely that uh, Ted is correct. And the only reason I suggest this, Ted, is that uh, Trump's vocabulary is far more limited than any chat GPT I've ever seen. Uh, he has only a vocabulary of about two or 300 words, as near as I can tell. Okay, so let's address this head on. Um, you know, we are talking about academia and um, Academia can be a lot of things. One of the things younger people need to be taught is things like ethics and behavior and so on. It's not just about writing a thesis paper or, or any kind of paper. So a lot of it is about that kind of behavior. Sorry, Olivia, it's, it looks like every once in a while you turn into a giant spider when you're typing on the screen. It's, it's a very interesting affordance. Um, how might these AI assistants help us culturally and emotionally bridge some gaps i mean like right now we're seeing some serious cultural issues in many different places in the world we don't need to uh, to highlight it but it does seem like you know we here in general as far as i know you we're all on the liberal side we're all on the caring for other people side so i think it's very easy for people like us to get on a little bit of a pony and say that the world would just be better if other people were more like us, which, of course, people who see things differently would say exactly the same. So with this emotional kind of um, Allen shape of thing, how might these systems help us 
even maybe through poetry. They write poetry, these darn things now. Not saying it's well written, but it's a not logical thing. Can anyone please stop me from talking? I will go on and on about this. Well, I have a quick one I could throw you away, and this is one that I would just love to see, and I think it would apply to what you're talking about. Um, we are bombarded with statistics and factoids and charts. Uh, I saw one just recently that was uh, along the lines of how uh, across a demographic spectrum, people in England live X many years longer than people in the US, right? It's a stunning, stunning statistic, and it looks very scientific, right? I would love to, out of the box, subscribe to some version of GPT that could uh, poke holes in it, give me ways to think about it, remind me that, say, like, U.S. Uh, may have far more variance because the uh, population size is so much larger, and, and help me think about statistics that were fed so that it may, it may not be, like, to the point of disproving it, but just saying there are more dimensions to this issue, right? And, and that would help me be a better thinker as I'm going through the news from the day. Yeah, I, I, that's really, really cool and relevant. And I see Les is coming up. And I just wanted to say that in, in terms of, you know, I haven't seen Valentina here for many months. I'm so glad she's in London. And we have shared all kinds of stories about different things in different places today. And one thing that helps in the olden days with literature, you would read a story from someone else's point of view, and you'd help to get into that person's mindset. And Les is coming up now. Les is not only an amazing academic, he is also a comic. So he has many different ways to express different points of view. And I think that if we can use these intelligences or whatever they're called to help people live your world and for you to live their world in an even more lively, interactive than a movie or a book, maybe that could be part of this conversation, Les. Well, um, well, I really wish now that I had prepared something as erudite and interesting as what you've just proposed. Um, but I, I, um, I kind of wanted to try out, and I hope you won't mind. You know, it's in, actually in much the same way that a comedian has an idea about what should be funny, and then goes on to stage just to try it out in front of some people and see um, whether whether they laugh or not. Um, I'd like to just try out a, a thought that I've been thinking for a while, number of years, uh, and particularly because of the uh, the audience we have here, you'll uh, you'll see the punch. Um, so I, 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 I firmly believe that AI doesn't stand for artificial intelligence. It stands for um, it stands for advanced IT. Right, because however clever the you know sort of the the machine learning the you know sort of what, whatever smarts are inside this uh, uh, inside the black box is going to be packaged up and sold to us as 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 IT through the same companies who provide us with all of the you know sort of things that we hate like you know sort of Outlook or our own institutional. Um, expenses claiming systems. They're going to be procured through the, the, the same routes for minimal price. And they're going to be, um, um, you know, sort of what's, um, the, we'll end up with terms and conditions, like, you know, sort of typical Microsoft terms and conditions. We provide no warranties, guarantees or conditions, whether expressed or implied, statutory or otherwise, including warranties of merchantability, fitness for a particular purpose or a non-infringement. So, you know, sort of, um, and yet, you know, sort of these, these AIs and chat GPT, they're taking on roles that we consider to be more, you know, sort of that we consider overlapping with humans in societies, you know, so so advisors and consultants. Um, and I, um, we know that if we're going to actually train up human uh, agents to undertake sort of important roles in society, you know, sort of programmers, advisors, uh, whatever, um, there, there is a complex context of overlapping frameworks of rights and responsibilities. It's not just, oh, you know, sort of, um, it's no one's fault if if this thing, um, you know, sort of kills everyone. Um, and so we have these degree level professional qualifications, professional society accreditations, employee contracts, HR policies, industrial regulations, national legislation and international treaty obligations. 
Uh, and I begin, I sort of quite, uh, I'd like to see us think about the way that it, as AIs take on more advanced and complex roles in society, they should be subject to a similar framework of obligations rather than just commercial terms and conditions. And so their training should be open to scrutiny. Uh, so think of chat GTP, uh, GPT. You know, we've already raised this as an issue. Its training should be open to scrutiny, like degrees are. Um, its achievements should be benchmarked, you know, sort of like when you achieve a qualification. Um, and their operation, its operation and application should be governed by community established standards of AI professionalism. Um, as well as baseline regulatory and legal requirements. And so my question to the group is, in short, should chat GPT be required to get a degree and join the ACM? Brackets, other professional societies are available. <laughs> Look, uh, Les, you know, I'm trying to get a degree under you and I wouldn't recommend anyone do it under anyone other than you. It's already hard enough without you and Dave. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you for advanced IT. I think that is a really useful phrase. It removes magic and it also, excuse me, it removes mystery, but also has uh, opportunities in there. And I'm repeating that because I saw Dave just joining us, which is brilliant. Um, anyone else have any comments on, yeah, Ted, you have a comment. Isn't, isn't there some restriction for professional degrees that they be human. Since, since, since women are allowed, that kind of implies that they're human. Well, yes, I'm not making any claims that ChatGPT is human or sentient or uh, conscious or anything. I'm just, uh, but then, you know, we've already started in sort of legal infrastructures to to confuse human and non-human. So, you know, sort of there are certain circumstances in which um, um, in which uh, companies are regarded as human um, in law. And so, um, you know, we, that's a convenient way of bringing an actor in society um, in, into sort of a regulatory framework, into a, a, a legislation. And so, you know, I I think, you know, sort of we, everyone's saying, uh, talking about chat GT, GPT ethics or, or, or AI ethics, everyone's talking about the obscurity of chat GPT training, you know, well, you know, sort of training, we have training standards, we expect people who are going to build bridges or write software to be able to say, yes, I got a degree from this university and the, you know, the, these degrees are accredited in these ways and they're all equivalent in, in this way. And, and I know that there will be certain learning outcomes that I've been able to demonstrate in order to, in order to get this qualification. Whereas at the moment, you know, sort of that's that's not what you get in chat GBT. So make them pass it. That you know, everyone's saying, oh, you know, sort of making universities you know, sort of obsolete and oh, chat GPT can pass all these exams. Well, let's make sure it does pass the exams. Let's have it scrutinized and let's see what the training materials it was, you know, were, were used for that. What is the course? What is the curriculum? You know, we know how to do this. Let's just, you know, sort of start uh, applying those things. Oh, I can, I can see, I can see Vintage shaking his head. Um, <laughs> um, if, if you don't mind my reaction, um, let me just explain why I'm, I'm reacting badly. Uh, what has has been shown, as you said, is that the kinds of exams that we uh, offer to try to verify that a person has absorbed the knowledge that they need in order to execute in accordance to, let's say, a professional degree, um, can be passed by the chat GPT. We should not make the mistake of therefore concluding that the chat GPT can function in the same way that the human does, having demonstrated the ability to pass the exam, because that's not what is going on. Uh, the chat GPT is capable of passing the exam, but is not capable of doing the kind of reasoning that we assume a human can do after they have shown that they can pass the exam. And so the exam is inadequate for validating that the chat GPT is, is capable of executing in accordance with the uh, you know, professional level that the, that the exam was intended to demonstrate. 
So we should be super, super careful about that. Uh, our problem is that the Turing test turned out to be too easy now for the chat GPT to pass, but it is not uh, evidence that the chat GPT is conscious and capable of reasoning and everything else. Yeah, I mean, it, that could be an entire week's worth of symposium talk. So thank you both. <laughs> uh, Mark and Alan, we're going to move over to Fabian's lightning in a minute. But if you have something relevant to this, please. No, Mark, if there's something to do with this, please go ahead. It's rather quick, uh, very quick, and, and, and it's sort of less humorous than perhaps it sounds. But I mean, in the sense that in this context, if you're going to have these players and you know, undergraduate fail. So what is the make work we give AIs? You know, what's the community service for an AI? I just thought that's one for Les to noodle on. Thank you. Alan? Uh, yeah, I'll be quick. It's just um, uh, the learning about previous models, even though we're in transformer land now, with GPT, it's still all based on some of the same principles, right? So, so those lessons could still apply. And the one that uh, comes to mind often is uh, an image recognizer that did a fantastic job of, of determining, you know, a dog versus uh, Arctic wolf versus wolf of some kind, right? It was an Arctic, and it was just did spot on great job of recognizing the, that that wolf versus anything else. And then when they reverse engineered the model. Um, they found, you know, assuming that it could figure out something that was very dog-like, that was very wolf-like, that it, you know, it had it down, and it wasn't anything at all that they expected. It was um, uh, the the strongest signal for the model that this was a wolf versus a dog was uh, a bit of fur and a bit of snow in the background, right? So it wasn't focused on the face or anything that we would think of as dog. It had made its own decisions about what was important. And that's based entirely on the corpora that it's, that, you know, the photos that 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 trained it, right? So, in in that way, we have to think of like uh, the technology that we use now with, you know, um, uh, programming languages as being kind of like cockroaches, and AI is almost like a spider in a spider web. It's very precarious. It's based entirely on its environment, whether it can make a good web. That's it. Yeah. Those. Sorry, I was mumbling there. Those those cases can be, um, uh, yeah, disturbing. Um, Fabian, over to you. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I'm just looking at Les's comment there in the chat. We will have that later. Yes, please go on. For... Then I'll try to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Is it okay? I can't hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'll I'll be brief. Uh, I'll I'll just give a little bit of historical context, um, meaning that we have we did have I think a significant change for the last couple of years in terms of AI, uh, in terms of what it can do, uh, and I think a lot of it started uh, with OpenAI for good and bad reasons. Uh, but actually, I think, yeah, they did spark at least uh, in terms of um, bringing the light back to that field uh, started a while ago. Uh, and I think a lot of it started from CLIP and uh, how basically they were able to do image generation, identification of different uh, pieces of images. Uh, yet it was still based on a lot of traditional, let's say, techniques. Uh, natural language processing, huge data sets, uh, things like embedding, how you can put uh, abstract, let's say, concepts uh, through a map or some kind of metric system, uh, and scale, just scale. I think a lot of it is like, despite uh, the amount of uh, quality engineering, R&D, uh, it's the amount of uh, both data, data sets, uh, energy put into it. Um, but I, I think in the end, uh, what what is interesting is when you can compose out of it. Uh, what what I think we can generate new text, we can generate uh, new images, we can generate quite a few new things. Um, and, but what what happens? I think what's the the shift in practice with these Lego bricks that I'm I'm trying to show as an illustration. 
uh, is that before we could still process text again using uh, NLTK, NLP techniques, a uh, uh, bunch of different uh, things, but we, we focused on the basics, for example, uh, grammar. Um, we did not focus on the whole image, the whole actual picture. Uh, we did not focus on sentences. Um, so that was very small scale. And basically my, my argument here for the, the shift and how we can try to think of it is uh, basically just a change of scale. Uh, there were still Legos, uh, they still bricks. Uh, we still have basically an interface to language, but that interface to language, and again, with the consequence of it being applied to uh, image generation, video generation, still comes from the textual description, uh, but basically is to reconsider where we are in the interface that we're not basically stuck at the low level that we were a couple of years ago. Uh, but still, it's just an interface. It's just an interface based on text. So it means, again, if we if we go back to the garbage in, garbage out, uh, because it's an interface to tool, if you don't ask it to do the right thing, you're not going to have anything interesting or even safe, let's say, at the end. But I think what what's the most um, powerful way to consider it, and uh, I'm trying to go back basically to the, the presentation uh, of this summer, is that text itself is an interface to tool and to each other. So what we what I suggest we reconsider here is that we still consider text and large language models, and again, the consequence like uh, image generation that comes from it uh, as an interface, but we change the level of abstraction instead of having just uh, the ability to play with a couple of bricks, we now through that interface with a higher level of abstraction, being able to manage a huge quantity uh, of words, sentences, uh, even more than this, but yet without still any understanding of it. So a better ability to manipulate larger amounts thanks to a higher level of abstraction and yet nothing magical behind it. That's it. Thank you. Agreed. It's uh, that, that, thank you, Fabian. That's a perfect analogy. It kind of links, in my mind, it's to the, uh, the cappuccino where you can print any kind of image onto the foam. Uh, it may be a beautiful image and it may be uh, something that no human could possibly do on their own, but it's has nothing to do with the cappuccino. Patrick, please go ahead and uh, don't forget brief intro. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Patrick Gukti. I'm a uh, artist, uh, theorist and curator at uh, Winona State University in Winona, Minnesota. And um, the one thing that I think that's a really interesting point is this idea of, of um, art aesthetics and uh, subjectivity. And um, what's what's happening here is that, uh, you know, we're talking about images that are almost maybe a little bit pornographic in nature that, you know, they, it gives this titillation that keeps giving us the cybernetic that keeps us sucking us into it. But the one thing is, is that I think that's interesting, the, the, the metaphor of the cappuccino. In other words, we can print on anything. So, you know, we, we get into this situation in which all of life, life is aestheticized, you know, and so, and, or even bespoke aestheticized. And then, you know, what, do, what does that say to the human condition? So this is the one thing is, is that what, what is a, what is a, um, um, you know, what is, you know, what is this except, you know, a really incredibly uh, complex, but still deterministic process, you know, in other words, is that uh, I, I think back with a lot of my time with uh, Brian Manning and uh, Aaron, I mean, Brian Masumi and Aaron Manning about, you know, the, their work in embodiment of, of, of consciousness and, you know, second cup. and um, you know, the idea is um, to me is that these things, these things don't have a subjectivity. And um, the thing that makes you, you know, get interested now are things like auto GPTs that, you know, when these things are feeding them into themselves, two things that I think of here is that, you know, if we wind into a situation in which, you know, what I call the life, which is lived, which is the basis of art, um, you know, what happens if, you know, there's, there's a, 
machine subjectivity and how does it um, express itself? And the idea is like, you know, how does the machine ex express itself, which it isn't doing? It's basically, you know, explicating its rules, uh, you know, which are extremely complex. And so the thing is, is that, you know, being that it doesn't have flesh and blood and fingers and toes and and uh, has walked through the world and such, you know, the machine, you know, the images or the poems or the whatever, if it chooses to even use our language or in visual or not, um, you know, it's going to be utterly alien. And, uh, you know, if it chooses to, you know, try to relate to, you know, even, even, and I think it's interesting is that then what happens if it tries to relate to us? Which brings us back to this whole idea of, of um, mm -hmm. I think, the idea of, you know, what does it mean to have, um, in, in the technologically um, enabled world, you know, a infinitely bespoke landscape, you know, fit, uh, digital, uh, digital and physical, um, what, does that, what does that do to the life which has lived? And then also, on the other hand, uh, is that, um, um, you know, what, what happens to an infinitely aestheticized um, culture which um, infinitely, uh, I mean, ultimately has no uh, has no has no subjectivity behind it, you know. And um, these are the things that I these are the things that I think about because I'm going to be giving, giving a talk of saying, is it art, you know? So you know, Fluxus and Cage and Duchamp and you know, you had found objects and process art and all these things. These are these are very valid historical forms, but also on the other hand. They had a human being behind them that had this experience. To me, I think that art and aesthetics, you know, aesthetics is one thing, but art is the experience of 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 lived life and sharing it. It's 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 a it's a recording and transmission of a of a of a subjectivity, which I would also go over into creative writing as well. And um, I'll be very interested to see what happens, you know, if an AI reaches a form of um, you know what what it think you know what it thinks is a subjectivity or we think is a subjectivity but we're nowhere near that now so anyway i'd like to throw that out yeah thank you patrick um any specific thoughts on that we are believe it or not running quite short on time um peter will be doing a brief talk in a minute uh okay i'd love to comment on that patrick uh it's a lot of great points. Um, I, I think actually, Frode, uh, a few weeks ago, you may have mentioned, or maybe I have hallucinated this, um, that the uh, the camera, you know, was was not a, a tool that we were born with, hmm. uh, and we're plastic enough in our abilities that we found a way to make art through it, right? Um, and and it's unquestionably beautiful and. But we can't say that we made it ourselves because we're certainly using a technology to capture the light. Um, I don't mean to make an exact metaphor to that in GPT because all these things are different. But uh, uh, it's just to say that we're we are incredibly plastic, and so it, it'll be exciting where it goes. I, I personally hope, and the best case scenario is that. Uh, we've been living in a massive amount of, of scientific management, you know, and, and that may be the kind of thing that admin work, that paperwork that GPT does really well. I think to pay, Fabian's point, we can never let it not, not currently get it to a point where it's handling critical end last mile kind of problems. There's still always going to have to be a human to check that it's not just, you know, going off the rails there. Uh, ideally it would get rid of all this cruft of stuff that we have to do every day and we could have more time with the life well lived, um, that would be the best case, and and hopefully that would also mean that social media would suddenly become much more like exhaust, and 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 that we could get the same kind of information without the toxicity. That's it. I think that's really important, Alan, and um, uh, we're going to give the floor over to Peter in a, in a few seconds. But uh, Patrick, you're coming from this from a very different perspective than we usually do. And that's kind of the whole point of this, because Les rightly can say things like, oh, it's like the Internet. Oh, it's like Wikipedia. Oh, it's like electricity. Oh, it's like this. Of course it is. But of course, it's also different. So that's why we need to have these discussions that are very off the wall 
and to talk about the artistic subjectivity of AI right now is, of course, absurd and stupid, which is why it's also great. Well, the one thing that I think is very interesting that makes this very Duchampian is the fact that if you give, if, if you take if you take a platform with the with with a given version and you give it the same seed, you give it the same prompt and the same and the same seed number, you're going to get the same you're going to get the same result. So, in other words, what you have is a near infinite near infinite and remember um, infinite number theory. You know there are multiple numbers of of infinites. You know the the thing is is that what you're doing is is that you're finding a combo a, a permutation kind of like Geisen, you know, from a a near infinite set, which I think is really interesting. Uh, yes, and um, it, you know these things that are. I, I use the word stupid. I just want to qualify that. I think it's important. Um, in this household, we use the word stupid uh, around my son, Edgar. You all, most of you know, I'm almost six years old, most wonderful creature in the universe, blah, blah, blah. We use it when it comes to traffic safety. Someone does something dangerous, that is stupid. We don't use it elsewhere. But what we're talking about here is going into a situation where this technology is landing on us. We have to feel the freedom and the safety to ask what maybe seem all kinds of questions, because otherwise we cannot understand it properly. Right. I also come from an artistic background, as as you do, Patrick. So it, it was wonderful to hear. Plus, it's so different from text in academia and AI. Now, uh, some of us we meet every Monday, same time as today, and I think we're going to be continuing this discussion. You're all extremely welcome to take part. All of it is uh, YouTube and and all of that good stuff. Um, so I hope that kind of perspective will keep coming in. And for the last. Uh, lightning, I'm going to ask um, Peter to try to do it. The lightning. Okay. Uh, Peter Wasilko again, attorney, programmer, hybrid, and independent scholar. And uh, I just want to focus a little bit on the bigger picture of performing research in the context of a library and a large collection of materials. Um, it's wonderful that we can have an AI system provide summarizations that's useful in triage of books. But what matters even more in the research process is figuring out what books are of more significance and how they connect to one another. Uh, take, for example, a book like The Heart of Our Cities. Uh, let's see. Ah. Oh, boy. It's OK. The green screen isn't working on that. Uh, but anyhow, um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't meant to disappear there. Uh, consider The Heart of Our Cities. Uh, this is a book by Victor Gruen looking at urban planning problems. This book was also adopted by Walt Disney as the Bible when he was planning Epcot as an actual experimental prototype community of tomorrow to be a city. Uh, it also tied in with the World's Fair movement. So you have this whole string of literature and a book that might not necessarily be heavily read could recur as being particularly important to individual scholars. So now let's imagine that we have a library catalog that allows us to start inputting metadata as individual researchers. I could indicate that that particular book was of high personal significance. And I might also look for other books in the collection that are of high personal significance, even if they're not used a lot in the connection, collection. We could also imagine a 3D visualization of the library shelves where the book text through augmented reality would be highlighted based upon their usage frequency. Um, but we can do a lot even before we have full augmented reality in just 2D. And I'd like to very briefly share my screen to show you the current state of the art in search user interfaces for the legal profession. And this is a system called FastCase. I'm going to go into share screen mode now. And hopefully this will work. Okay. Um, can you see the display now? Are we working? Yes. Most okay, good. Great. All right, now here we've entered a search First Amendment and prior restraint. And the system provides a timeline visualization. And if you look, each circle represents a case. And the first one started around uh, let's see, zooming in in scale. After 1950, around the 60s, the first case law started to appear. The size of each circle represents how many citations there are to that case. So right away we can see just from the general size of the circles that some cases here, like US versus Burke, 
are cited quite a lot. And the second circle in each visualization here represents how often that case is cited among other cases that appeared within our search results so that you can spot cases that are a little bit more peripheral versus the most significant ones. So as an attorney, I'd come in here and right away, I would start wanting to read Alexander versus Burke. I'd want to pull up Alderman versus Philadelphia Housing Authority and US versus Quateron. And it's a very useful tool. Now, we also have some cases where that's going to run astray. For instance, if we're looking for red flag laws, red flag laws really were not present in the 1920s. So here we have a case that came up as being high, but it just had the words red flag because the system doesn't have a concept of red flag in the modern sense. So relevant cases would actually be these tiny little dots here around 2020, as opposed to the big dot that was cited a lot because the words red flag appeared literally within the results. Um, and it gives you a nice way to sort of visualize case law and get a sense again of how often cases are cited and which cases are the most important to look at. So if I'm looking at questions related to New York City income tax, clearly we have down here the 1970s case. And um, again, just sort of mousing over, you can get the name of the case and brief little summaries. Um, the results also provide a more traditional visualization where you can just see the results and summaries and they can be flagged as to whether a case is still live law or dead law. But that visualization is absolutely invaluable. And again, what will be even better as opposed to only looking at citations within the individual book or within the individual case are to look at how they're related to one another in the active research collections of people who are researching in that area. So I might find that I'd be much more interested in Freud's personal map of the literature than I am in some arbitrary random grad student or in the average of the results looked at by all average grad students. So the potential to take the AI and start applying it to metadata about how the literature is connected is gonna be a real gold mine in the future. And I'll leave it at that. That was really nice going into the whole sculpture kind of thing that we, we alluded to in the beginning. So um, two things in, in the closing minutes here. Number one is I would like to re-invite you all for Monday meetings, come if you can, because when you look at the vast range of brains in this community, it's really quite amazing. Uh, we have almost nothing in common uh, which is so important, you know, this is not the same same kind of thinking. So in closing, I would really like to hear um, from as many of you as want to speak, what you feel you've learned today, even if it's just a keyword or something brief. But I would also like to invite you to submit a written piece if you want. Some of you have already done that, that goes in our journal and then goes in our book. And one of the reasons I think it's really, really important, obviously the future of text series of books is nothing. We're not Springer or anybody famous, but things are in there and they are available in the future. Last year, we really worked on perspectives for VR. We'll keep doing that. And the idea with that is we are moving into an entirely new world, digitally speaking, both in terms of VR and AI. So in the generation, people will not know what it's like to live without this as a constant companion. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna to look to us for inspirations of how else it could have been. When I was studying advertising, which, was, which is where I come from at Syracuse University, when I realized that you know, being a big Mac guy, that Mac and Windows are both awful and could be better, um, I looked at, you know, developed my own philosophy and so on, and then I got Howard Rheingold's book, Tools for Thought because I decided I had to know what people thought computers could be before they were instantiated in the Mac and Windows. That's how I came across Doug Engelbart, of course. And that's how you know a lot of this community happened. So to try for us now to understand Doug is really, really hard. And even though we're lucky enough to have Ted with us, to understand Ted is also extremely hard, even though he's here. 
and you know there are some of us here who are geniuses <clears throat> Vince I won't mention you by name you know we have to forget this idea of who the hell are you Doug Engelbart as my mentor and close friend towards the end he actually admitted to me straight up that a lot of the things he wanted to say about this he was afraid that people would say who the hell are you and which is crazy considering he invented most of what we use when it comes to interactive computing so I counseled him you know the great mind in the same way I will counsel us and that is it doesn't matter who we are if we honestly engage with the subject in discourse right so what you guys can write down about what you want AI to be and I really like advanced IT as a better name please do so if you can publish it somewhere famous absolutely do that but at least we have a forum where we can write down things like you know is there's will there be subjective art you know and Livia who is very different from me I love and respect you but we visually look at things differently fantastic and then we have Barbara gracing us not only with her presence today but as a strong member of the community, reminding us that our brain isn't just between our ears. And how does that relate? It, it's, it's such an amazing um, community. So I'm gonna hand it over first, if you don't mind, Bent, to Dini, and then to you. So you may have the last word um, over the next few minutes, uh, Dini. Yeah, Stephanie was wondering what we're gonna do with the chat. And I had asked earlier about that. There were some comments that were made in response to, to people's presentations that we um, didn't go over. And so they were pretty important responses. Sometimes people don't speak up in public, they'll write their responses in chat. So how are we handling this, the chat, especially those in-depth responses to people's presentations? That's both a real and a meta question. Um, it, it, it is a pain. I would prefer not to have a chat during these meetings for exactly that reason, but then we do lose the people who want it only um, uh, ben, did you do, want to do closing comments or did you want to talk about something like that? Because I certainly don't want to ignore Dini's point. Well, actually, I like the chat. And the reason I like the chat is it's a non-interrupting thing. Um, and it, often if I put things in the chat, it's not because I want people to react to them right away. I'd rather just make sure that somehow the thought that hit my mind at the moment got captured somehow. So perhaps that's a different intention. Uh, than others uh, putting things into the chat. But it's relevant to the small comment I'd like to make about this whole session. I don't know about the rest of you, but every time I get engaged in these uh, sessions, I feel like I'm going on a voyage of discovery because uh, each of you brings uh, to the landscape something I probably never would have seen or never saw before, or maybe have seen before and I'm enjoying revisiting. So this voyage of discovery, this conversation that we're in, uh, continues to mesmerize me, and I find it refreshing and thought-provoking. What's not to like about that? Vint, you said it more eloquently than I ever could. I, I'm so grateful for, for this community, and both for those who can be there a lot and for those who come in and out. And uh, what I propose then regarding the chat is, uh, after this, I'm going to put the video online, of course, uh, I'm going to have a proper transcript done. I also put the chat online. Every single chat log for the last year and a half is online on our website. I'll email all of you. Uh, Pete, if you could please put your email address in the chat, that would be great, since I don't have access to you outside of that. So what I propose we do is, um, okay, I showed you earlier citing and reader, and none of you started screaming, this is amazing, you should have, um, because it's such a simple thing, and it comes from Mark's um, pushing me on the, the importance of not just citing, we all know that, but citation access. So Mark was the one who said, you click on a citation, wouldn't it be useful if? So I've been expanding and expanding on that to the point that if you have the work, it opens it instantly. That means that what I would like to see in this community as my dream would be for all of you, when I send you the chat, either write something in response to it or join us on a Monday and refer to it. So we may not be able to fit all the time in for one chat per session, but if something is addressable, we can address it. Does that seem reasonable? Yes. I volunteer to curate the chat so that I can take the chat, put the email addresses you need together, um, specific responses to topics, organize it so it's not just 
when we keep the chat intact as a um, document, but then we take the, I'll take that and then organize it so that it makes some sense. If you, yeah, if you that's fantastic. Th thank you, Dini. Let, let's, yeah, I would love for you to do that. And also now we're addressing the beginning of the meeting today where I asked, how can we make this more accessible in the future? And if we're going to use some kind of AI to help us understand our conversations, the better we feed it, the better we'll get something out of it, right? So yeah, that, that would be very useful. And, and one of the things that is interesting about this community, and which is very frustrating actually, is also the benefit of so many different types of minds. Some people like to talk. Some people couldn't write an article if their life depended on it. That's you, Alan. But you know, you're the most eloquent thinker and speaker. Some people will only write and refuse to talk. You know, how do we create a, a, a cohesive dialogue over time that we can refer back to? It, it's not easy, but I'm, I'm very grateful for the different perspectives on how to try to do that. Are you going to say something? No. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm right. Uh, mo most of you know Valentina from before. She helped us so much last year, and as she's saying now, she writes. She doesn't. Well, now I wrote the press release, which now, of course, ChatGPT will do, right? Yes. So <laughs> I'm basically useless. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah, entirely, entirely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, Dini, you and me will communicate a little bit about the uh, the chats, and um, you're all welcome every single Monday, and. Um, you know, if, if if you have perspectives of how to move forward, let's do that. Now, I also wanted to mention uh, ACM came up a few times and I had a wonderful chat with um, Wayne Graves, who is the technical director. And he said something really interesting to me, at least. Number one, the ACM members want PDFs. They don't want to read on the web, which was a huge surprise for them, but great for citing because a PDF is a thing. It's not an ethereal thing. Also, he was talking about how their XML is actually pretty good. There's a lot of metadata there. So the way that we are dealing with our own data here, dog fooding, if you want to use the Silicon Valley term, you know, it, it is actually useful. And I do honestly believe in generations that this forum will be one of many that students will look at. So anything we can do to make ourselves findable and understandable, great. Is there room for a quick comment? I know Vince going to close, so I don't want to hold up the proceedings. It's just a very quick thing to add a rider to your point about the ACM that I think is pertinent, that as part of the analysis I did of Hypertext, which is 33 years old, so quite, I mean, quite long running, but a small conference, is that arguably about a third, a third of the elements in it are missing. So all the tutorials, all the workshops that people actually went to in the early days, if you talk to the people who went there, don't exist well some of them are scattered around the web and even this year about three of those winked out of existence and someone turned off you know um frank shipman's personal archive and it's just gone well what isn't in the internet archive um <clears throat> but that's an interesting point uh, now we don't print to paper what is the actual cost of the publishing i mean there's obviously something to run the servers and things but 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 i i, I we haven't started asking why we're still pretending to make paper books that no one will ever read on paper when it comes to things like conference things because an awful lot of data that i suspect is captured uh and and never put into a form that's usable uh our future scholars will not thank us i mean it's a lot of formatting you know formatting and media production you know there's still some labor involved in that uh, no i accept that but i i'm thinking less about it's sort of lots of text and lots of papers, but just the fact that, yes, you know, there was this workshop, it involved these people, that there's quite a lot of really useful stuff there, and perhaps an abstract that is, that is not of itself a vast amount of work. I totally agree that if you had to format, you know, another 50% of papers and check they're all right, but that's a big deal. But a lot of the information is broadly these days already there during the time of the conference. Uh, and if we bothered to systematize it, that could easily be swept into the library and provide really rich and valuable metadata um, because we don't have to use, we, we don't have to use paper anymore. We just choose to think we have to. And I think, I think it, 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 it's not to our betterment. 
Yeah, I think digital ephemera is the metadata, and you know, take uh, collecting that and put it in and archiving it. I think that's that's a fantastic idea. Right. So on that, um, obviously a huge topic. Uh, I believe very much in um, using the internet as a means of communication, but not of storage, which is why you know, link rot the web, all of that stuff is fine. But if you have something important, put it on it currently PDF or equivalent or in a data storage. Now, in addition to that, I mean, look at all your faces, right? There is real metadata in our faces. And I think it's really important that we put this on YouTube and I hope YouTube will have it available or similar for the next couple of hundred years. And, you know, there's no question about that being valuable, but, you know, we just need to get these thoughts down as clearly and as robustly as we can. Right. I mean, I, I just want to say it again. This is, these are the last few months or years where people will not be living in extended reality and extended intelligence environments is the only time in human history where this time will happen. You know, if we don't deeply think of what we want, we're just going to get what we're given. And that's not freedom, uh, Patrick, and then we are closing. Okay, I just say one one last thing is that we have to keep in mind, you know, the uh, the areas of the world in which this is going to be affecting, you know, humanity because of the fact that I was talking to a gentleman who was, you know, uh, marking wanting to market a, a web three AR, um, you know, uh, um, headset. And I said, well, he I said, who's this for? He says, well, it's for everyone. And I said, well, you know, how's this going to help? And I do have one is I, I how's this going to help my um, Bangladeshi uh, fish farmer, you know, who's 50, 50 miles south of Dhaka. And he says, I have to get back with you on that. So I think we have to have a certain sense of, sense of perspective on, you know, who, who these things are going to serve. Uh, yes. Yes. And no. Okay. Um, since you used the example of Bangladeshi Dhaka, you know, one of my very oldest friends is actually from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. He passed away a year on Monday. So that brings back a lot of things. Um, you know, who to augment? I don't think augmenting has to be everywhere all at once. Let's not forget some people like to watch Fox News, and I'm not trying to be trite. I'm saying that no. forgetting the politi political nature of Fox News, it is in a way pre-digested thought, right? Yes. So some people will want to engage with the world in different ways. And Doug Engelbart wanted to augment a fighter pilot, not someone sitting in tourist class going to a beach holiday. You know, who right. are we? But that, that is my perspective. If someone yeah. wants to augment fishing, for instance, because a fish, a fisherman, you know, they're suffering now. There are a huge amount of boats. Why do we have Somali pirates? It's because Chinese and European boats come and take their fish. They're real issues. If someone wants to make an app to help them, brilliant. You know, that is an actually important thing. And that is one of the many issues with this kind of um, a community. Who do we want? Who do we care about first? It doesn't mean we hate everyone else. No, and, and have a user group, and and that awareness is all I'm asking for. Yeah, no, no, it, it's it's a provocation, and I think it's an absolutely worthwhile provocation, and we need to have some kind of perspective on that. So, thank you very much. Um, just wonderful being here with you guys today, and Dave Duror. I hope next time we will hear from you and not just see smiles from you and uh, wonderful. So I'll see some of you on Monday and we will have another session like this, one of these monthly type sessions soon. Uh, Dini and me will work on getting the right kind of paperwork to you guys. Um, so any practical questions before we finish? All right, bye everyone. <laughs>